Welcome everyone to the 13th annual Peter A. Yazi uh, Distinguished Lecture on Intellectual Property. I'm Michael Carroll, co-faculty director of the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property. We are simply delighted to have you all here. You'll hear from me again in a minute as I introduce uh, our named, uh, the, the person our, our lecture is named after. But I'm very delighted to introduce our dean, uh, uh, our interim dean, Heather Hughes, who's uh, agreed to give us some brief remarks and welcome you on behalf of the school. And without further ado, Dean Hughes. Good evening. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 13th annual Peter A. Yazzie Distinguished Lecture on Intellectual Property, named in honor of Professor Yazzie. I'm also pleased that we can welcome Professor Fumi Ariwa from George Mason University for this year's lecture. The lecture was named for Peter in recognition of his extraordinary contributions to the study of intellectual property at American and for his lasting contributions to the elevation of the public interest as a primary concern of this domain of law and policy. As an educator, Peter has encouraged students to explore and become actively engaged in all facets of copyright law. An early leader and advocate for copyright law in the public interest, a founder of the Digital Future Coalition, Professor Yazi has long been at the forefront of intellectual property and copyright law with a particular focus on promoting user interests in the law. Perhaps most centrally to us, Professor Yazi founded the two most important and lasting intellectual property institutions here at America, American, the Glushko Samuelson, but also in America. <laughs> high impact nationally, but not just in uh, the Americas, but globally, all over the world. <laughs> Peter's work is of tremendous impact. Um, so he founded the Glushko Samuelson Intellectual Property Law Clinic and the Program on Information Justice and Intellectual Property, lasting impactful programs here at WCL. We are proud to have Peter as a lasting member of our community. Thank you for all you've done to elevate our place and the place of the public interest in intellectual property law. Thank you all for joining us tonight. And since Dean Hughes did most of what I was assigned to do, which was to invite, <laughs> introduce <laughs> Peter, because I will just say that um, he is an ongoing active member of our community and, and he and I are actually working on co-authoring an article. Um, in addition to all the other things you heard about, he's also been uh, a, a senior member of the Copyright uh, uh, Society of the US and on the editorial board of its journal and just uh, an all around Anything that's got copyright in the name, Peter Yazzie's name is also associated with it. Um, and I'm just delighted on uh, Peter. We have some of our, the students in copyright, uh, the copyright class who I just taught, uh, who have, have come and for 40 plus years, Peter was the copyright teacher here at American University Washington College of Law. So Peter, please uh, uh, welcome Fundi. These wonderful presentations. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Mike. We're, we're full of overstatements about me, which I am correct, <laughs> um, except for one that in that the idea of that I taught copyright for 40 plus years, 30 plus years is more like it because it actually took me about 10 years to persuade the administration of the law school that it was worth doing. Mm -hmm. And I came prepared, but it took me a decade to succeed in being permitted to offer that course for the first time. So credit where credit is due and credit to Christine Farley as a co-founder of BIDJA, without whom we would not be here today. So with those, those, those tiny, tiny corrections and revisions, I'm gonna to proceed to the main order of business, which is the introduction. You know, as, as IP lawyers, we are, of course, devoted to the somewhat self-flattering proposition that good choices about legal norms in our field can affect the amount and perhaps even the kind and quality of the new culture that our society produces. Many of us overlook, I think, to our detriment, 
the way in which market forces supplement, distort, or even negate the force of law. But that cannot be said of tonight's speaker, Professor Oluwafumiyawo Ariwa, who has made this phenomenon, this space of intersection, the special focus of her amazing work. Here at Pidgeot, we like multidisciplinary polymaths with a strong footing in the real world of cultural and or entrepreneurial <laughs> practice. <laughs> and as it just happens, when we hit all the boxes in that description, as her impressive resume reciting a BA and ultimately a law degree from Harvard with a Berkeley PhD in anthropology and a master's in applied economics from Michigan, along the way to demonstrate. <laughs> Just as significant to the overall picture, I think, are her early experiences advising tech startups and in a long engagement with the practice of classical singing. Likewise, her history of teaching and studying outside the United States, throughout Europe and indeed all over the world, helps to guarantee that her work is at all times the opposite of the parochial. I have been a big fan of her work, her cross-cutting work, since she began her stellar teaching career and have followed her writing throughout. Uh, you will forgive me, but I think her breakthrough article, at least it's the one that sort of kind of overwhelmed me, was from J.C. Bach to Hip Hop, Musical Borrowing, Copyright, and Cultural Context in, 19, in 2006. Since then, she's gone from strength to strength with too many publications and too many genres and too many fields of inquiry, including Africana, post-colonial studies, and critical accountancy to, equally, equally, uh, to easily catalog. This may be the first time that I have ever introduced anyone specializing in critical accountancy. <laughs> always, however, always, uh, Funmi's work returns to the, the confluence of information technology, creative industries, law and the shaping of culture, as evidenced by example for her very recent and wonderful Vanderbilt article with Matt Stahl called Prospecting Sharecropping and the Recording Business, which I really strongly recommend. It's in Vanderbilt Tech and Entertainment and Tech Journal, and it's really good. And then, of course, we're all waiting for the book. We're all waiting for the big book, Curating Black Ownership from Cambridge, Curating Black Music, Ownership and Commodification from Cambridge, which will be soon shelved alongside her, her prize-winning 2001 Disrupting Africa Technology Law and Development. It's, again, uh, a, a great book, and I expect it's, it's the new volume to be even, even more exciting. So this is just extremely special. This is this is my chance to introduce not only an old friend uh, who I've known, gosh, since you were at Case, and who it's just delightful to be able to say is now no further than across town at George Mason, and to introduce somebody who, to me at least, exemplifies the, the values of the enterprise that this lecture is designed to celebrate. So I'm gonna turn over the podium for a podium for a talk, which I've been awaiting anxiously, a talk about all the kinds of intersectionality that I've been discussing at their best concerning the artistic legacy of a very disruptive writer, Lorraine Hansberry. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's such an honor to be here today. Um, I want to thank PGIP um, for inviting me to give this lecture. And it, it's such an honor to be here, partly because uh, Peter Yazzie has been such an influential 
um, so influential on my own scholarship. When I first started teaching in the academy and writing, his his writings were were just so important to the develop, de development of my own scholarship. So that's one reason it's such an, it's an extra special honor to be here today, to be with someone who's been so important, not only to me, but also other, other scholars, and also so um, accessible and open and friendly and just, just a resource. Um, so I, I can't speak, I can't, I don't think I can find words to say how, how, how much of a pleasure it is to be here today. So what I'm going to try to do, I'm going to try to link my discussion of Lorraine Hansberry to my current work. So the name of my talk is The Postmortem Afterlife of Copyright for Artistic Legacies. And I think it's something that we should talk about more. Copyright term is now life plus 70. So for many creators, copyright exists for longer than they lived or for, for a close amount of time to the amount of time that they lived. So we don't have a lot of talk. One of the things that I'm going to end up saying at the end of my talk, so I might as well start at the beginning, is we don't have sufficient drop doctrine to deal with some of the things that happens with copyright estates. And one of the things that this project is seeking to do is thinking about how do you deal, how should copyright deal with things that happen, particularly in state court, because that's where trust in states cases are heard. And this and other cases really highlight that there's a gap sometimes between the policy intent and goals of copyright and what actually may happen to copyright, not only in trust and estates cases, but generally in cases involving contracts. So one of the things I'm doing as part of this collaborative project is trying to think about how do we develop copyright doctrine to, to address this gap? Because I think um, entrepreneurial people, <laughs> and I use entrepreneurial in quotes, are quite aware of this gap and they may well use it in ways that are to the detriment of the actual intent of creators, what creators wanted to be done with their artistic legacy. I'm going to talk about, first of all, race, private law, and social justice. And then I want to briefly talk about my work in music and connect this project to, to my work in music. And then I'm going to talk about the mysteries of Lorraine Hansberry because she's someone that we know very well, but we actually don't know a lot about her and what happened to her estate after she died. And one of the things that's incredible is the 60th anniversary of her death is this coming January. She was only 34 years old when she died. She left such an imprint on the world in that short amount of time. And she was really an extraordinary person. So one of the things I want to talk about is how extraordinary she was. And she's still probably the most important Black, one of the most important figures in the American theater canon and certainly the most widely read African-American female playwright in theater history. So I wanna, I'm gonna end up there, but first let me take you through a little bit of what, how, I got to, how I got to thinking about this project and how I came on board with this project. I wanna first talk about race, private law, and social justice. As you know, a lot of my work is about music. Um, I actually write a lot about royalty accounting, which is critical accountancy, which is something you actually have to do as, Creators that don't understand accounting often end up very unhappy with their fate because um, one of my favorite quotes that I talk about when I talk about my music book is the late Sinead O'Connor, that she was quoted in an article saying that, you know, she told her kids, if, I, if you ever find me dead, don't call 911, call my accountant. Because the minute, the minute I die, the recording industry is going to start to release records and not pay me. Not, well, not pay me, but not pay the estate. So someone needs to be looking out at how they're treating the accounting after I died. And I think that, to me, that really says something about how business practice in the creative industries is, is something that we need to think about more carefully because I think it often ends up being to the detriment of a lot of artists, especially artists who aren't hugely, hugely successful. Hugely successful artists can often renegotiate their deals, but not every artist. Copyright should not just speak to the wildly successful artist. It should work for all artists, not just the stars. And so I'm going to just note that and let me start by saying that um, cases, the music cases I talk about, I write mostly about African American musicians. The music cases I talk about and the Hansberry case, they really draw attention to the lived experience of creators, particularly African-American creators, um, in creative business activities, um, disputes. And we don't really have enough understanding of bias in commercial civil cases. We, we talk about bias in criminal law cases, but we don't really talk much about bias in commercial civil cases. And I've spent many years now looking at particularly what we call royalty recovery cases, which is about R&B artists who got exploited, 
So they, they weren't getting paid their royalties. So they found these people who were former recording industry executives for the most part, who said, I'll collect your royalties for you. And they ended up taking like 50% of the royalties. And these agreements are almost impossible to exit. So reading a lot of those cases made me realize that we may need to think about how, how do we actually deal with this problem of exploitation? Because we're seeing second level exploitation of people who aren't, they aren't lawyers, they aren't accountants, that you shouldn't have to be to be a creator. So with that background, let me talk about IP and social justice. I think that the Cambridge Handbook of Intellectual Property and Social Just Justice, which I think was just released this year, has a wonderful chapters, including one by Margaret Chan and Robert Chang, and they talk about how IP legal doctrines, as well, in addition to, and their chapter is a long name, so I'll read it. The Indians who are not heard in a band that must not be named, racial formation and social justice in intellectual property law. I love that title, but I can't remember it ever. So they talk about how IP legal doctrines, um, like all other areas of law, construct racialized subjects and systems of racial domination. And it can create fundamental co conflict with fundamental commitments of civil rights laws to promote racial equality. And I think there's a there's an interesting we can juxtapose what is sort of what happened in with civil rights cases with, with what was happening in the realm of the creative with respect to how artists were treated. And there's some real dissonance between those two sides. And I think we need to, one of the things that this chapter highlights is we need to think about what's happening in the creative realm from a civil rights perspective and looking at questions of bias, questions about um what I call. I call racial arbitrage, and I'll tell you what I mean about that in a second. So copyright in many ways is a cultural gate gatekeeper. And one of the things that key, that's key about copyright, where we see a lot of implicit and sometimes explicit racial assumptions, is conceptions of creativity, particularly in my work, conceptions of African-American creativity. Co copyright also has a complex relationship with state law, contracts, trust in a state, marriage and divorce. For those of you that do music, you may be following. There's a fascinating case in the Ninth Circuit right now um, between Sunny uh, Sunny, Sunny Bono Estate and Cher about their marital separation agreement, and it's a really fascinating case because it highlights that, that it highlights points of tension between copyright and and uh, family law, essentially marriage and divorce law. Um, so, with that as background, I want to talk about my book. My book, my book is now has a new title, and I'm hoping to finish it by January. It's called Curating Black Culture, Music, Money, and Marginalization. So I, I wanna talk about marginalization within the context of the creative industries because African-American creators, especially in earlier periods, have been significantly marginalized. And part of it has to do with conceptions of black creativity. And I have this quote from Thomas Jefferson, who um, is an interesting character in many ways. He, he, he basically says, among the blacks is misery enough, God knows, but no poetry. And he's talking about how he doesn't really feel like, he says that in music, black people are generally more gifted than white people for, with accurate ears for tune and time, but he doesn't think they have the intellectual capability to engage in composition, complicated harmony, melody. And he says that um, that this, in the second, the last, I'm gonna end with the last statement here. He basically says that the improvement of blacks in body and mind in the first instance of their mixture with the whites has been observed by everyone and proves that their inferiority is not the effect merely of their condition of life. He basically didn't think that African-Americans had the capacity to create works that he would constitute, consider to be creative. And it's sort of ironic because I was sort of chatting with email with a music person who said basically he he was very musical, but he was not any great shakes himself in terms of his composition, composition <laughs> skills. So I'm not sure. I think he maybe should have looked in the mirror in terms of when he was talking about the ability to create, to, 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 be, to be a composer. So I, I'm not sure he, he's the one to make that judgment. But certainly this underlying questions about African-American creativity, I think are at the core of questions of how we allocate rights. Because I think sometimes there's an underlying belief that this is not really creativity from African Americans. It's ne it's often not stated, but that underlying belief I think shapes ideas about entitlement. So I already told you the title of my book. So the United States popular United States is a dominant force in popular music globally and popular culture generally. U.S. films, American films, American music. This really started. Music was the first great cultural export for the United States. In the United States in the 19th century, there was an assumption that culture came from Europe. By the mid 20th century, the United States had become a major exporter of culture. And that major export of culture was, it was really started with music. 
And minstrelsy was the first um, distinctly American form of popular culture. Now, minstrelsy is a, and it spread throughout the world. Um, and the thing that's interesting is many people who saw minstrel shows had never actually met a black person. So at one point, one very famous minstrel group actually had to take off their blackface so they could show that, that they were actually white. Um, so minstrel, minstrelsy, um, it reinforced racial ideologies of white supremacy and branded African-Americans as inferior. And that's an important starting point when we think about the spread of US popular culture. Because a lot of it, it with, with American popular culture spread a lot of ideas about African-American inferiority. And those ideas, even though legal frameworks have changed since that time, some of those ideas are still with us when we start to think about, I'm not forwarding, am I? When, I start to, when we start to think about um, culture. Um, so Mr. City and popular culture. So um, this is about Bert Willie. <coughs> I'm glad to bring that off. Is it too close? Yeah. It is. So, so let me move it back. Is that better? Okay. I want to talk a bit about Burt Williams because Burt Williams was the first black superstar. Sorry, just a little closer. A little closer? Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, that's better. That's it. Okay. So Burt Williams was the first black superstar. He was a central figure on the vaudeville circuit, and he was actually likely the most successful black recording star in the pre-blues era, so before, before 1920. Um, he... Uh, performed in the Ziegfeld Follies, and he performed in blackface. Um, there's a fa very famous quote that was actually published in a, or a story that was um, published in the Chicago Defender that tells us a lot about the context within which African-American performers during his era had to perform. They had to perform in an era of segregation. So the logistics of performing in some of the venues where he had to perform were incredibly challenging. So he tells us this uh, Chicago Defender article, which was, which was, um, published like 30 years after he died. He died just over a century ago in um, 1922. It talks about his an interaction, uh, I'm not sure if it actually happened, with, with um, Eddie Cantor, who was a famous white comedian. So he basically at one point found Williams eating alone. And he basically told Williams, you, you must be, you want to be exclusive. You, you're such a star, you can't eat with other people. And Burt Williams had to explain to him that he couldn't eat in the restaurant because of segregation. So he had been refused service in the restaurant because of its race. And this highlights that even superstars during that era, African-American creators, performers, and artists suffered from racism and loss of rights because of segregation. And what I want to talk about is how segregation still exists in the recording industry in many respects. Um, now, um, Susan McClary and other musicologists have pointed out the centrality of African-American music to innovation in music. Um, she calls it the, uh, a series of succession of Black genres as the most important tributary flowing in today's, today's music. That, that centrality, if we look at the marginal economic status of African-Americans, particularly in er earlier eras, is in contrast with the centrality of the music as a source of innovation. So, um, it, uh, sorry, my formatting is a little messed up. I don't actually use PowerPoint and these were converted, so they didn't convert so well. Um, we tend to think about music in a segregated fashion today. We tend to think about certain kinds of music as being white music and certain kinds of music as being black music. And that exists partly because the recording industry was built um, on segregated, a segregated basis. There was a determination that certain types of music were black and certain types of music were white. And that created real problems for people. There were a lot of, for instance, black string bands prior to the recording era. Most of that black string bands didn't get recorded and the black string band tradition, in fact, came close to dying out because it wasn't in a black category. Um, we often think about classical music as being white music. And one of the things that we know from archival and other, other evidence, um, this is someone talking about Monticello, which was a big, interesting place for music. I talk about it a bit in my book. I don't have time to talk about it today. Um, this fellow basically says, while there is something of a historiographic tradition of imagining certain musical activities as white, such as the aristocratic musical gatherings in Williamsburg and later Monticello that were so important to Jefferson, archival evidence suggests otherwise. So these, these, these racial, racialized categories, genre categories of music that we have are really constructions. They, don't, they didn't really actually, actually exist in practice. And we actually know a very large part of the fiddle tradition comes out of the African-American, the country music fiddle tradition, comes out of the African-American tradition. And the banjo is an African instrument. So the banjo crossed over from being an, Af an, an instrument that was originally used by slaves, crossed over to being a major instrument 
in the country music tradition. And needless to say, after minstrelsy, not many African Americans are probably were probably walking around carrying banjos, um, in the, certainly in the late 19th and early 20th century, because the imagery was so pernicious and and awful. So when we think about marginalization of African African American creators in um, in music, we have to think about segregation in terms of exclusion and genre categories, what I call ecosystems of racial exploitation, and copyright assumptions in terms of treatment of characteristic features of African American music, as well as the use of business and law to enforce racial boundaries, all together combined with a lack of transparency. So the question that I ask in this book is, when we think about conceptions of cultural ownership, who's authorized to represent, create, and perform? What images are used to represent artists? Because the minstrel sheet music Im imagery is truly horrific. I did an archival trip to Tennessee to see one of the biggest minstrel sheet music collections. It was very hard after a while. I said, I'm gonna spend a day here and no more because you just the images are really pretty awful. And whose creativity is recognized and rewarded such? So with that, I wanna talk about um, ecosystems of racial exploitation, which I think is what we have in music. And what I want to talk about, I'm going to pass through some slides, and I'll make the slides available later, because I want to get to talking about the Lorraine Hansberry case. I just want to say that we have something that I that we can only characterize as, as racial arbitrage. So one of the things we know with the early race records is race records was off, race records were often more profitable when black artists were recorded. Why? because they could exploit them more than white artists. So the profits that race record companies made were often in fact higher. And that reflects what I call a kind of uh, racial arbitrage. Um, there's an anthropologist, uh, Christian Philmark Tompkins, who actually had a really interesting discussion of racial arbitrage in a book that was published th this year, where he talks about racial arbitrage as being a useful in thinking about ways Certain agents are, are well positioned to traverse the gap between racial factions and create value from their unique interpretive capacities. So the thing about racial arbitrage is it, it reflects a kind of business model that is, has been pervasive, particularly in the early music area, uh, early music arena, early uh, popular music arena and starting in the 1920s, where you have structures that facilitate extractive intermediaries who exploit those with less power, access to resources, or with other sources of scarcity of opportunity, including in relation to race. And I'm, it's, it's clearly, it's not just African-American artists that have been exploited. It's, it's a broader characteristic of the recording industry. But I think there's a double marginalization, a double level layer of exploitation for many African-American artists. So um, racial arbitrage can in fact constitute a kind of jurisdictional arbitrage where people are taking advantage. If I'm a 1920s, if I'm a 1920s blues artist and I get exploited by contract, what is my remedy? Think of the 1920s, where, where could I go to court to have a jury hear my case? Many of these people didn't have a, an effective remedy because this the uh, recording industry arose during the midst of a racial cat cataclysm in the United States. There was so much racial violence, riots, um, the Tulsa race massacre. So effectively, many of the early African-American artists did not have a remedy. And many people in the industry were pretty aware of that. And that's I, that constitutes a kind of racial arbitrage because you know you can exploit someone who might not actually have an avenue of opportunity, certainly in that era. And even in today's era, we have to ask, how will courts actually hear these cases? And this touches on issues like racial empathy and understanding of context, which we don't always get as much as we, we should. So countering racial arbitrage, we need to think about innovative legal strategies to create incentives to discourage racial arbitrage and other forms of profit seeking from disadvantaged communities. Um, examples in music include John Lomax, who I don't have time to talk about, but now I think that will get me to Lorraine Hansberry. So I wanna talk about this case because I think it, it shows, it gives us an example of racial arbitrage. But before I talk about that, I wanna talk about the fact that some of the things I'm talking about are persistent and recurring patterns. I urge you to take a look at it. There was a documentary released last month called Taking Back the Groove. And it's about a 1970s disco producer called Richie Weeks. He had a number one song um, on the dance charts in 1980, and he was not paid for, for decades. And the, the, this 32 minute documentary is about him teaming up with a music label owner and a long time, long time fan who clawed back the rights to Weeks music. But it's really sort of a, it's an optimistic story because it shows maybe you can get your rights back. But it's also a sad story because the people knew they weren't paying him 
And they just said, well, we don't have to pay you. And I did a podcast with um, house music, um, Vince Lawrence, who's a, a, a figure in house music. And at the beginning of our podcast, he said, basically, someone was using his music and he went to them and said, you know, you're using my music. This is in the 2020s. You're using my music. And they said, well, sue us. So when we see there's some recurring and persistent patterns that still are a problem that we need to think about. How do we resolve this? There's also a, a documentary. This was a BBC CBC documentary that was premiered on September 21st, um, 2024, and it's called Paid in Full, The Battle for Black Music. And it's a very interesting documentary, although I haven't seen it. My husband did see it. It's only showing in the UK and Canada, so you have to figure out a way to see it there. But um, I'm told it's very interesting, so I, I highly recommend it. So with that, let's talk about Lorraine Hansberry. So with that background, when we think about music, music, in music, we see very forms of exploitation and racial arbitrage used in various contexts in ways that ultimately are to the, often to the detriment of artists. Now, the mysteries of Lorraine Hansberry reveal a couple of different things. It's not just music where we have some of these issues about exclusion and um, artists not being able, to, being able to achieve their full potential because of potential racial and gender barriers. There's something called the Lilies in Theater, and the Lilies has been doing something called a count since 2015, and they look at who, what, what playwrights actually get produced. And in their most recent uh, version, the third in installment of the count, and this is the ninth year of the project, they say it's clear that although the Ameri American theater continues to add diversity um, to, of its playwrights, neither gender nor racial parity has, has yet been achieved in terms of production. So in theater, some of the same issues exist in that it may be difficult to get your work produced if you're a BIPOC or female playwright. So some of the same barriers and exclusionary practices exist. And I wanna talk about Lorraine Hansberry, my Lorraine Hansberry project. So I, I came on board this project partly because there are a lot of synergies between this project and the work I've been doing in music. It's a collaborative research project. It's interdisciplinary and it, 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 is, it involves what I call excavation, which is what I do in my music work. Go and try to find, go to archives, uh, secondary accounts, interviews, wherever you can find information about the past, because some of this is happened a long time ago. It's really hard to unearth the context of what was happening a long time ago. So we've been using archival records, court filings, contracts and other legal documents, journalistic accounts and secondary sources, interviews and accounting records. I, I do do accounting. So I do get excited when I get to see accounting records, which is not everyone. So there are three, there, Lorraine Hansberry has three intertwined mysteries. There's a personal mystery, an artistic mystery, and a legal mystery. The legal mystery is going to be the focus of this lecture. And there's going to be coming installments next year on these other mysteries. So I urge you to send me an email if you want to keep posted on what's happening with the Lorraine Hansberry installment uh, of, of discussion, continuing discussion about Lorraine Hansberry and the 60th anniversary of her death. So she was the first Black woman to have a play produced on Broadway. She won the Drama Critics Circle Award. For, um, she... Uh, her work, A Raisin in the Sun, premiered on Broadway in 1959 when she was 28 years old. She today is the most widely produced and read, um, the, uh, she's the most widely produced, I mean, her play, this is the most widely produced and read play by an African-American woman. She died when she was 34 years old. So what we know of her, Raisin was her premiere, so that in six short years, she really made an impact in ways that I think we can't, I think it's just hard to really contemplate how, how much of an impact she made. She was also an activist. She was, she was a radical. She was, um, she was committed to, she insisted that black workers must be at the heart of the struggle for liberation. She pushed RFK to make a moral commitment on civil rights. And Imani Perry's book, Looking for Lorraine, which I highly recommend, it's really an extraordinary book. She talks about how Lorraine's story is a story that remains in the gaps, despite the fact that she was widely influential. She was an artist and an activist. She was strident and striking, a socialist with a black nationalist perspective. And I say that because of cur curation is something that happened after she died in terms of who decided which Lorraine was going to be presented. And this really highlights the question of who decides what stories will be told. One of the things that um, Robert Johnson's stepsister published a book in 2020 called Brother Robert, Growing Up with Robert Johnson. And she's probably one of the last people living who knew Robert Johnson, who become, became very famous after his death, uh, in part because of British rock and roll singers and musicians really liked his music. And one of the things that's pointed out, um, Elijah Wald in the, in the introduction to the book says that the story of Robert Johnson has been mostly told by white blues fans. 
And they, they used a version of him that reflected their own stereotypical assumptions. It didn't reflect the real Robert Johnson. And many of the things they did were tremendously painful. The things they did and said, they took pictures, they appropriated things, were tremendously painful to the family. So one of the questions that really is an issue with people that come from marginalized communities is who's actually presenting who they are. Because often the community may lose control of that. Certainly that happened with Robert Johnson and his family. In the case of Lorraine Hansberry, let, let's talk about how she was presented. For a long time, now Lorraine Hansberry had a hidden personal history. Lorraine Hansberry was, a, was outspoken about racial justice. She wasn't, she reckoned with her own sexuality in private. She was married for nine years to, to Robert Nemeroff. And though she was never out publicly, um, she privately identified as lesbian at a, at a time when homosexuality was illegal in New York City and gays and lesbians were demonized. So that's a part of Lorraine Hansberry that is now more public, but for a long time after her death, it wasn't really public. And that partly has to do with who's deciding what, we, what information we know. And I'll talk about, so I wanna talk about law, copyright, and the aftermath of Lorraine, Hansb Lorraine Hansberry's state. So many of us have read the case, Hansberry v. Lee, the Supreme Court case from 1940. That's about her family. It's about restrictive, it's a case about a restrictive covenants. Her family, much like the family in Raisin in the Sun, Raisin in the Sun reflects important elements of her actual life. Her family integrated a neighborhood outside of Chicago. And uh, there was an issue in relation to racial covenants. And we know they won in the Hansberry v. Lee case, although we didn't get actual racial covenants being ruled illegal until later. Th there was a history. Her family ended up losing their property in Chicago. So there's a history of property loss that I think is a really important thing to understand is when we, as we look at her will. She left her literary legacy to the women in her life primarily her mother and sister, because they didn't have sources of income. She wanted to make sure they didn't have jobs. Her mother was older. Her mother died actually in 1966, the year after she died. They didn't have a source of income, so she left her literary legacy to them. And I want to talk about, they didn't end up getting it, so I want to talk about what happened, at least probably not as she would have intended, um, but that's that's speculation. We don't actually know that. My, my sense is what happened is what she would have intended. She, she and Robert Nemeroff married in 1953. They had separated by 1957. They divorced 10 months before she died. We think on, in March 1964 in Juarez, Mexico, we haven't actually seen the divorce certificate. So I, <laughs> that's why I put a question mark. I, I like to, everything else, we, you know, I like, we like to see the documents. Um, so she died, um, as I mentioned, almost 60 years ago. And Robert Nemeroff, her then ex-husband, appears to have made decisions about her health care even after their divorce. Both Robert and her lover, Dorothy Seculus, um, took care of her as she was dying. So um, RN provided, they had a complicated relationship. He provided cover for her at a time when coming out would have been really difficult. Um, their professional lives were intertwined despite the fact that they had a divorce, that they, they were divorced. Had, they were separated for much for, and divorced for longer than they'd been married. Um, she, for instance, she directed a musical he produced. She might have employed him. Um, this is her will. Um, this last will and testament was written just a few months before she died in January 1965. So this is a sort of summary of what happened in her will. She appointed Robert Nemeroff as the executor and trustee of her will. She appointed her cousin, her first cousin, Chenille uh, Perry Ryder. Chenille Perry was her professional name, but her name was Chenille Perry Ryder. Sometimes I'll refer to her as either name as the substitute executor and substitute trustee. And I emphasize that because Chenille Ryder was passed over twice to be a substitute executor and trustee. And we'll talk about that. I'll talk about that shortly. What ended up happening is that Robert Nemeroff became a co-trustee with Clarence B. Jones. And then Clarence B. Jones became the actual successor trustee of the Lorraine Hansberry um, estate. Now, in terms of beneficiaries, Robert, uh, Robert Nemeroff was just, um, he was only entitled to receive a few personal items, sentimental items. The bulk of her estate was given to women, to her mother, who was the original life income beneficiary. She was supposed to get $8,500 a year. Her sister was a life income beneficiary after her mother's death. She had a, her, her sister Mamie's, and her Mamie is still alive. Mamie will be 102 years old next April. Um, Mamie's Daughter, Nantil, was a contingent life income beneficiary until she was 25. And then Dorothy Seculis, her lover, was also a contingent life income beneficiary. The remainder of her estate was to go to um, nonprofits, civil rights organizations, funds or organizations for the benefit of writers, and charity or charities. 
So this was her intent as expressed in her will. So a couple of points about her will. This will reflects the fact that she really trusted Robert Nemiroff. Um, and she had a good backup in her cousin being the, the substitute trustee and, and executor. Um, and again, she only received, he only received a specific bequest um, for items of spend, uh, sentimental value, but he was not an intended beneficiary of her will. So let's talk about what happens. Uh, before I talk about what, what happens, I want to talk about copyright has a long afterlife. As a result, creators are reliant on the integrity and trustworthiness of estate executors and trustees to effectuate what they wanted to happen after they died. And this, and ideally, uh, uh, executors and trustees are fiduciaries. Some of the strongest fiduciary duties they are, 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 are for trustees and um, executors. However, they may have little effective, little or no effective oversight if you don't have a family or a nonprofit that's looking over their shoulder. And there's also a potentially complex intersection of copyright and state law, which um, I think arose in this case. So I want to talk about RN self-dealing and the sale of the estate to himself. So Robert Nemiroff her ex, was her ex-husband. He was the executor and trustee. He became her post-mortem collaborator. He engaged in self-dealing, and he did make some payments to beneficiaries, but he eventually, just, he eventually purchased the estate himself. So... Let's talk. Let's take that one at a time. So, um, he he had a complicated relationship with her. At times, he acknowledged that they were divorced. At other times, he didn't acknowledge that they were divorced. Um, this is an article in um, Out Magazine from Elise Harris, where he, he he's quoted as saying, "Divorce did not in any way affect the closeness of our friendship, or the working relationships between us, or the size of my loss." He would call her himself her husband until his death. He sometimes, he did actually also had a second wife. He did sometimes acknowledge that they were divorced, but when um, when he reported her death, he, he, he said he was her husband. And it wasn't until I think Jet Magazine somehow got a scoop that they were actually divorced. And they said, but aren't you divorced? And I think at that point, he finally acknowledged it publicly. Um, so when he became executor and trustee, he engaged in significant self-dealing. And again, executors and trustees are held to the highest fiduciary standard of care, and must act in the best interest of beneficiaries and avoid any conflicts of interest. Um, so while, while still executor and trustee, he hired himself to finish and adopt her works. Now he was not known to be a playwright or to have any literary skill or talent. He negotiated a percentage of earnings that could otherwise have flowed to the estate and they flow, it flowed into his pocket. There was also questionable allocation of costs to the Lorraine Hansberry estate. Um, in fact, somehow the New York Attorney General got a tip about his self-dealing. So the New York Attorney General actually intervened in the Westchester surrogate court proceeding and basically filed a petition in response to Nemiroff's self-dealing. The Attorney General said in the petition highlighted that on numerous occasions before, before the sale of the literary property, Nemiroff, who depended on the estate assets for his own livelihood, had dealt with himself in these in these business dealings. And this is the production of the decadence literary and theatrical property. So he was self-dealing and taking funds for himself. He was living off of the estate. Um, the petition went on to say that these dealings must be looked on with great suspicion regarding the law of fiduciaries, especially in the context of an estate with uncommon assets consisting primarily of theatrical and literary properties. And these dealings were reported to the court. They're documented between 1965 and 1968 in the accounts submitted by Nemiroff. Um, in the years immediately following Lorraine's death, he did keep up with payments to her mother, Nanny, and then her sister, Mamie, after her mother died. We don't, there's, there's an incomplete, incomplete um, forensic accounting. There's some questions that we're investigating about payments to himself and charges to the estate. So as I mentioned, he became her postmortem collaborator. We haven't actually uncovered any instances of his being credited as a co-author or creative collaborator during her lifetime. So, and, and there's, I think, maybe not been a lot of transparency about the nature of this collaboration. Um, so it, it does raise some questions about the postmortem integrity of her works. And that's part of the artistic part that I'm not talking about, but it's something that needs to be discussed. He eventually decided to purchase the estate. Um, between late 19, 1968 and 1970, he petitions the surrogate court to clarify issues in the will and eventually to sell the estate to himself outright. And my remaining discussion is going to talk about his sale of the estate to himself. <clears throat> so he ended up purchasing the estate for $40,000 in 1972 using 
$10,000 in cash up front. The remainder was payable. The re remaining $30,000 was payable under the terms of a note that had no provisions for default. Because it's, it's not clear. Th there, was, there was a formal proceeding, and there were guardian ad litems for the nonprofits and for Nantil, who was the minor contingent beneficiary minor. So there were a lot of lawyers in the proceedings about the sale of the estate. But the outcome um, is perplexing. We're not, not entirely sure how he was able to sell it to himself for that particular price. And um, also the fact that he was able to divert some income from the estate to himself may well have enabled him to lower the sale price because the estate was less worth less because less was flowing into the estate because he was some of it was going to, into his pocket. That's speculation, but we're, we're trying to verify that. Um, so if we look at um, the Westchester court proceedings, there's little or no consideration given to copyright, the copyright implications of his activities. Um, when copyright is raised, it's usually for the benefit of the Nemiroff parties. One of the things we see clearly in this case is a, um, a systematic pattern of use and application of copyright in multiple proceedings in ways that are, we don't think are consistent with the federal copyright, do, federal copyright doctrine or policy goals. However, this is all happening in state court. So, and the, unfortunately the family, did, I don't think entirely, many many Hansberry did have lawyers, but it's not clear that they, it's not clear to us what kind of case, how effective those lawyers were. Because at the end of the day, well, you're gonna hear very shortly. Um, so he continues to act as executor throughout this whole process. Um, and following the purchase, he's actually named, he remains executor of the Lorraine Hansberry estate for the sole purposes of copyright and renewals. But the estate otherwise has no other executor. So there's no one to represent the estate. And the estate actually still had an interest because the estate had contractual rights. There were contracts that were um, supposed to give money to the estate, but there's actually, as far as we can tell, been none, no executor other than him. And we know that he continued to use letterhead that identified him as the executor of the Lorraine Hansberry estate into the 1980s. So this is an estate that it does not clear it really had anyone to represent it effectively. And this is the this is the order um, that the court the court says shall continue at the discretion of this court as executor of the said estate for the sole purpose of renewing United States copyrights. Um, now he 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 passes away in 1991. So his widow, um, Jewel Handy Gresham Nemiroff, petitions the New York Surrogate Court. And one of the things to note, um, I'm going to talk about Shamil Perry in a second, but his widow petitions the surrogate court for fiduciary powers in 1993 in order to be able to renew um, Hansberry copyrights. And the court grants her those fiduciary powers. One of the things we haven't been able to verify is we can't tell what works were going to fall into the public domain. She says that I need this power to renew copyright because these works are going to fall into the public domain. We don't know what works those are. We're still trying to figure out what work she's talking about. And notably, she uses her racial identity as an African-American woman writer as validating this claim to the estate of her dead husband's ex-wife. Now, and this is, the, this is the order granting her fiduciary powers um, because she's a fiduciary of Nemiroff, her deceased husband. Um, so I wanna talk about court processes and assumptions in this case, because you might ask, how, would, how could this actually have happened? The court, seems to rely on the unique and largely unsub unsubstantiated fact that he has unique credentials to protect the literary legacy. And, and um, despite his pervasive self-dealing, and this is also discussed, uh, reflected in public discussions of his role, um, people, the New York, his New York Times obituary talks about him as champion of Lorraine Hansberry's works. Um, and the question is, do we see implicit exception, acceptance in multiple court contexts? of racial assumptions about creativity, because this is not someone who was a writer. I think one of the things that really is instructive for me, if, if you reverse the races and have a prominent white male playwright of her stature, I think it's inconceivable that his ex-wife, who has no, who's not a writer and has no literary credentials or skills, could then buy his estate after self-dealing and somehow be seen as a champion of his works because I think there's some implicit racial assumptions playing out here that, that enabled him to do this. And I think in some ways he's an, entre he's an entrepreneur in that way. He understood that, I think. What's most interesting is the passing over of Chanel Perry, because she should have been appointed an executor when he decided to sell the estate to himself. And she should have been um, 
or, or trustee instead of Clarence Jones. She, she should have been appointed trustee. As, I think both ex executor and trustee. And certainly when Jewel wanted fiduciary powers, she was the substitute executor. So she should have been, been appointed executor. So she was passed over twice for the first time during court proceedings when he's selling the estate to himself. She was represented to be just an actress with little or no business experience in handling the types of business transactions in which the estate is involved. So that was the basis for passing her over. In the 1993 petition, um, Nemiroff's widow, Jewel, states that uh, Shanil uh, Perry Ryder did not respond to their efforts to reach her. So, and the court just accepted that. But I want to talk just a little bit about her. So Shanil Perry Ryder was a pioneering theater director. She was one of the first Black women to direct plays off Broadway. She had an MFA from the Art Institute of Chicago. She studied at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts in 1954 as a Fulbright Scholar. She transferred to the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts. From 1986 to 2001, she ran the theater program at Lehman College at CUNY. So the assertions that were made about her in court, I think, were clearly not correct. And to say that she's just an actress and Robert Nemeroff is somehow more qualified, she had far, far more qualifications than he did to actually be an executor or trustee of the estate. So I think this brings us to talking, to thinking and talking about lawyers and representation. Um, we have significant potential issues in creative context after, especially after people pass away, if they don't, if they don't have the right people looking after their estate. And this is heightened with creators from marginalized communities. And two lawyers who actually participated in the court proceedings in this case were actually later disbarred. So there's some real issues about representation that I don't have time to go into today, but we're going to do more extended discussion. And Clarence Jones, Clarence B. Jones, who was the co-trustee and successor trustee to Robert Nemeroff, um, actually, at some point around 1976, he just went, seems to have gone missing because Mamie Hansberry actually has to file a court proceeding. In 1982, she files saying that he's been non-compliant. He hasn't been paying her for five years. Um, he finally did, after four years of avoidance, he filed an incomplete accounting with which Robert Abrams, then New York Attorney General, called, weighed in calling the fees excessive and unreasonable. One of the things we're looking into is we want to get better understanding. Oh, sorry, I didn't advance the slide. Better understanding about what, what he was actually doing when he was a trustee. One thing we know he wasn't doing is he wasn't paying Mamie. So I started out by saying Lorraine Hansberry wanted the, her female relatives to be supported. Mamie in 1976 starts to petition. This is just three years after he buys the estate. And um, this after Jones becoming the sole trustee after the estate purchase is done. Mamie begins petitioning the surrogate court because she's in dire need of funds. She says, I am in dire need of funds, which Mr. Jones was supposed to be sending me regularly. I commenced this proceeding in December 1976, and soon it will be four years since he failed to properly to properly respond. A contrast, Robert Nemiroff, when he died, he left a gross estate of $263,000, which in uh, six, uh, 2024 is $606,000. Um, when his wife died in, in 2005, um, that's, that's the time that we see the estate value. By the time of the de death of his second wife, the estate value had increased over $3.5 million. So this is a sizable estate that I think, where I think the payments... Don't, didn't reflect. I, I think we can ask serious questions about whether these payments reflect what Lorraine Hansberry had intended. I would suggest not, but I think this is something we're analyzing and looking at further. And Clarence Jones was then permitted to resign as trustee in 1983 after he submitted a final accounting for the estate. Um, so I think these court cases reflect assumptions about capacity and competence based on race and gender. RN being uniquely qualified despite clear self-dealing clear evidence of self-dealing, little evidence of competence in business affairs, and a lack of successful career as a writer. Chanel Perry becomes just, a, just an actress with little understanding of the business and not responsive to legal inquiries. Um, courts seem to accept racialized tropes without significant scrutiny and filings and the assertions made by petitioners. <laughs> so future considerations, I think we need to think about the role and responsibilities of lawyers in private law contexts in connection with social justice. And think about representation and form versus vigorous re substantive re representation. Because I think in the proceedings to sell the estate, we had, we had lawyers there, but I'm not sure we really had vigorous substantive representation. And that really matters. And I think we also need to think about creative lawyer lawyering to address pervasive wrongs and racial and other forms of arbitrage, especially at this intersection of copyright law and state law. 
Um, so I think th this case highlights um, the need for advocacy and education for artists, because even well-known artists can have their living and postmortem wishes subverted, and also the development of legal strategies to, do, to, to address these kinds of inequities in the LH case, and then also in cases involving musicians. So I'm going to end there. I want to thank you. It's been a pleasure. Well, one, one. Rich, thick account, and you know, compliments due to everyone on your team who has been working on this material because it's clearly, it's clearly a team effort. I wanted to shift a little to the question of the, I, I guess it's the cultural, so I had a, the racial arbitrage question that is the decisions that never are and others representing the estate. The, the decisions about the appropriate exploitation of the, the work that they made, and whether those are, are also subject to critique. We, well, do you mean the judges, or? No, I mean the, the, the successors of interest, Nemiroff in particular. The decisions about how and where and what form, the work itself was going to be presented. We have a film, we have a musical. Yes. Uh, There's some big issues, especially the musical, because that's a, uh, when the will, as far as we can tell, um, when the will was revealed to the public, the family didn't say much. But I think they were very, my sense is, my understanding is, they were not happy about the musical, because um, the musical had an all-white writing team. And I, I think what, whatever we know about Lorraine Hansberry, she would not have chosen an all-white writing team for her musical. And I think um, it's also not clear, again, when you have an executor negotiating for his own interest and the estate, I think if you had an, the, the hypothetical I think about is, what if you had a neutral executor who's actually fulfilling that executive's fiduciary duty for the benefit of beneficiaries? I think they would have cut a different deal and the estate would have had a continuing stream of income, even if it ended up getting sold to him. They, why, why, if you're gonna sell that stream of income, I think the estate would have cut a different deal. And that's, I think the real detriment is that you didn't have that neutral executor who's cutting the deals. If, if let's say you're gonna do a musical, they might say, well, I want this many points, and this is, and, and I'm gonna hold on to some rights. So I think the lack of a neutral executor is a is the biggest problem in this case and and it's sort of perplexing that the court it's the court didn't seem to do that as far as we can tell we're still investigating but i, I don't see evidence that the court understood that what about the stability of the text <laughs> were, were controversial decisions made in They're, that regard yes it, it's hard to know because the um the own the Literary papers are owned by the descendants of Robert Nemiroff. And they, they were at the Schomburg, but it, I think they're, uh, it's not clear because you, I, I don't know, I don't know, I, I don't think one could go to them and say, show me who made what changes. So I think there is, a, I think some of the uh, people, the playwrights on our collaborative team are, are very, I think, are very interested in that. There have been some changes made in her, her manuscripts. That, so the artistic integrity of her works, I think, are remain a question to be explored. I, I mean, first of all, this is such great work and hard work. I mean, I think it's important for everyone to understand how much time and effort it takes to do the, the fact investigation. And I guess just for the students, you know, as you think about a lawyer's skills, you need you, you understand how much of the law was relevant to the presentation. You also have to find the facts and hunt for the facts. And these facts weren't sitting there in plain daylight. They, you, you had to turn over a lot of uh, rocks to find them. They were, they were hiding. So congratulations for all of that diligence. And I, I really like, and maybe if you could say a, a, li a little bit more and maybe talk to the students about, you know, future looking, how do we help protect creators the next time that they succeed and are getting close to the end of their lives, 
What you're talking about the role of the lawyer. So what more specifically do you want to see the next generation of lawyers do when they they're committed to the project of uh, making sure creators enjoy the benefits of copyright? Well, I think it's important to. I think a couple of different things. One, it's important to understand context. And I'm an anthropologist, so I like, like to talk about context. But it's important to understand the fact that creators from marginalized communities, there may be other gaps. For instance, there's a big trust and escape, trust and estates gap, racial trust and estates gap, gap that we've seen come to fore when we look at what happened with Aretha Franklin. We had a we had court proceedings about which will under the sofa is, is the right will. Prince didn't leave an estate plan either. So, and that's that's that ref, that reflects a broader broader patterns of marginalization. But I think it's really important for creators to have their estate plan together, working with them and understanding what was their intent. Because Prince was really controlling about his music when he, when he was alive. And going back to Sinead O'Connor, one of the first things after he died is he started to see all this music released that I didn't think he would ever have authorized. And that suggests to me that he didn't really connect his. There wasn't a connection between his estate plan and what he what he desired to be done with his music and and this is this is this is a, a long-standing historical problem so i think part of it is i think you have to always think about how do you do vigorous representation because i think here we see court proceedings with many lawyers there are four or five lawyers in many of these court proceedings but i think at the end of the day i'm not sure we get close to what the intent of the of the of Lorraine hansberry actually was and, and part of it is the fact finding is difficult i think in this in, when you have a complex interaction between federal and state law, sometimes things get lost. And I think this is not the only copyright case where you end up having things happen in state court that effectively may enable the people enable people to do an end run around, around federal copyright law. So I think part of it is making sure you get the right expertise and you do the fact finding, even though it can be difficult, fact finding in this case would probably be quite expensive. But if someone had done it in 1967 or 1968, we would be in much better shape now. And I think the family, what I think is the biggest tragedy here is you have the sister who's going to court saying, I'm in dire need of money. And there's someone who wasn't an intended beneficiary that basically managed to become essentially the sole beneficiary of this estate. Um, and that's a, that's, that's a problem. This is not the only case of this happening, but I think in this case, it was probably preventable um, if we could go back in time. But I think we're all operating in the present. It's hard to know what's going to happen in the future. But I think vigorous representation is really, really important. And, and creative lawyering. I think there's there's the need for real creative lawyering at this intersection of federal and state law when we talk about copyright. And thinking about, I know, I know that Maggie Chan's working on an article about copyright abuse. Thinking about what kinds of doctrines and moving beyond maybe something that just looks like patent abuse to think about inequitable conduct. How do you deal with inequitable conduct from a copyright law perspective. Maybe copyright is where we need to deal with this. Maybe this shouldn't be state law. Maybe we need to have copyright doctrines at the federal level. That might eventually, because I think part of it is we need to think about how do we create incentives to have the right outcomes. And I think that this case shows us that I think the incentives are not quite in the right place because there's incentive to do, this is a kind of, I think a kind of racial arbitrage and there's incentives to do that. And I think it needs to be penalized. Um, if, we, if it's penalized, people are probably going to be less likely to do it. If there, you can actually have a cause of action where you can say, look, look at what just happened. Now it's 60 years later. It's much harder to do something about something that happened 60 years ago. Oh